Chapters forty nine, fifty, and fifty one of The Moon and Sixpence. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Termin Diane. The Moon and Sixpence by W. Somerset Maugham. Chapter forty nine. I lived at the Hotel de la Fleur and Mrs. Johnson, the proprietress, had a sad story to tell of lost opportunity. After Strickland's death, certain of his effects were sold by auction in the market-place at Pibite, and she went to it herself, because there was among the truck an American stove she wanted. She paid twenty-seven francs for it. "'There were a dozen pictures,' she told me, "'but they were unframed, and nobody wanted them. Some of them sold for as much as ten francs.' but mostly they went for five or six. Just think, if I'd bought them I should be a rich woman now. But Tiare Johnson would never under any circumstances have been rich. She could not keep money. The daughter of a native and an English sea-captain settled in Tahiti. When I knew her she was a woman of fifty, who looked older and of enormous proportions, tall and extremely stout. She would have been of imposing presence if the good nature of her face had not made it impossible for her to express anything but kindliness. Her arms were like legs of mutton, her breasts like giant cabbages, her face, broad and fleshy, gave you an impression of almost indecent nakedness, and vast chin succeeded to vast chin. I do not know how many of them there were. They fell away voluminously into the capaciousness of her bosom. She was dressed usually in a pink Mother Hubbard, and she wore all day long a large straw hat. But when she let down her hair, which she did now and then, for she was vain of it, you saw that it was long and dark and curly, and her eyes had remained young and vivacious. Her laughter was the most catching I ever heard. It would begin a low peal in her throat, and would grow louder and louder, till her whole vast body shook. She loved three things, a joke, a glass of wine, and a handsome man. To have known her is a privilege. She was the best cook on the island, and she adored good food. From morning till night you saw her sitting on a low chair in the kitchen, surrounded by a Chinese cook and two or three native girls, giving her orders, chatting sociably with all and sundry, and tasting the savoury messes she devised. When she wished to do honour to a friend, she cooked the dinner with her own hands. Hospitality was a passion with her, and there was no one on the island who need go without a dinner when there was anything to eat at the Hotel de la Fleur. She never turned her customers out of her house because they did not pay their bills. She always hoped they would pay when they could. There was one man there who had fallen on adversity, and to him she had given board and lodging for several months. When the Chinese laundryman refused to wash for him without payment, she had sent his things to be washed with hers. She could not allow the poor fellow to go about in a dirty shirt, she said, and since he was a man and men must smoke, she gave him a franc a day for cigarettes. She used him with the same affability as those of her clients who paid their bills once a week. Age and obesity had made her inapt for love, but she took a keen interest in the amatory affairs of the young. She looked upon venery as the natural occupation for men and women, and was ever ready with precept and example from her own wide experience. "'I was not fifteen when my father found that I had a lover,' she said. "'He was the third mate on the Tropic Bird, a good-looking boy.' She sighed a little. "'They say a woman always remembers her first lover with affection.' but perhaps she does not always remember him. My father was a sensible man. What did he do? I asked. He thrashed me with an inch of my life, and then he made me marry Captain Johnson. I didn't mind. He was older, of course, but he was good-looking, too. Tiare, her father had called her by the name of the white-scented flower, which, they tell you, if you have once smelt, will always draw you back to Tahiti in the end, however far you may have roamed. Tiare remembered Strickland very well. He used to come here sometimes, and I used to see him walking about Papite. I was sorry for him. He was so thin, and he never had any money. When I heard he was in town, I used to send a boy to find him, 
and make him come to dinner with me. I got him a job once or twice, but he couldn't stick to anything. After a little while he wanted to get back to the bush, and one morning he would be gone. Strickland reached Tahiti about six months after he left Marseilles. He worked his passage on a sailing vessel that was making a trip from Auckland to San Francisco, and he arrived with a box of paints, an easel, and a dozen canvases. He had a few pounds in his pocket, for he had found work in Sydney, and he took a small room in a native house outside the town. I think the moment he reached Tahiti he felt himself at home. Tiare told me that he said to her once, "'I've been scrubbing the deck, and all at once a chap said to me, "'Why, there it is!' And I looked up, and I saw the outline of the island. I knew right away there was the place I'd been looking for all my life. Then we came near, and I seemed to recognise it. Sometimes, when I walk about, it all seems familiar. I could swear I've lived here before. "'Sometimes it takes them like that,' said Tiare. I've known men come on shore for a few hours while their ship was taking in cargo, and never go back. And I've known men who came here to be in an office for a year, and they cursed the place, and when they went away they took their dying oath they'd hang themselves before they ever came back again. And in six months you'd see them land once more, and they'd tell you they couldn't live anywhere else. End of chapter 49 Chapter 50 I have an idea that some men are born out of their due place. Accident has cast them amid certain surroundings, but they have always a nostalgia for a home they know not. They are strangers in their birthplace, and the leafy lanes they have known from childhood, or the populous streets in which they have played, remain but a place of passage. They may spend their whole lives aliens among their kindred, and remain aloof among the only scenes they have ever known. Perhaps it is this sense of strangeness that sends men far and wide in the search for something permanent to which they may attach themselves. Perhaps some deep-rooted atavism urges the wanderer back to lands which his ancestors left in the dim beginnings of history. Sometimes a man hits upon a place to which he mysteriously feels that he belongs. Here is the home he sought, and he will settle amid scenes that he has never seen before, among men he has never known, as though they were familiar to him from his birth. Here at last he finds rest. I told Tiare the story of a man I had known at St. Thomas's Hospital. He was a Jew named Abraham, a blond, rather stout young man, shy and very unassuming. But he had remarkable gifts. He entered the hospital with a scholarship, and during the five years of the curriculum gained every prize that was open to him. He was made house physician and house surgeon. His brilliance was allowed by all. Finally, he was elected to a position on the staff, and his career was assured. So far as human things can be predicted, it was certain he would rise to the greatest heights of his profession. Honours and wealth awaited him. Before he entered upon his new duties, he wished to take a holiday and, having no private means, he went as surgeon on a tramp-steamer to the Levant. It did not generally carry a doctor, but one of the senior surgeons at the hospital knew a director of the line, and Abraham was taken on as a favour. In a few weeks the authorities received his resignation of the coveted position on the staff. It created profound astonishment, and wild rumours were current. Whenever a man does anything unexpected— his fellows ascribe it to the most discreditable motives. But there was a man ready to step into Abraham's shoes, and Abraham was forgotten. Nothing more was heard of him. He vanished. It was perhaps ten years later that, one morning on board ship about to land at Alexandria, I was bidden to line up with the other passengers for the doctor's examination. The doctor was a stout man in shabby clothes, and when he took off his hat, I noticed that he was very bald. I had an idea that I had seen him before. Suddenly I remembered. "'Abraham!' I said. He turned to me with a puzzled look, and then, recognising me, seized my hand. After expressions of surprise on either side, hearing that I meant to spend the night in Alexandria, 
he asked me to dine with him at the English club. When we met again I declared my astonishment at finding him there. It was a very modest position that he occupied, and there was about him an air of straitened circumstance. Then he told me his story. When he set out on his holiday in the Mediterranean, he had every intention of returning to London and his appointment at St. Thomas's. One morning the tramp docked at Alexandria, and from the deck he looked at the city, white in the sunlight, and the crowd on the wharf. He saw the natives in their shabby gabardines, the blacks from the Sudan, the noisy throng of Greeks and Italians, the grave Turks in tarbushes, the sunshine and the blue sky. And something happened to him. He could not describe it. It was like a thunderclap, he said. And then, dissatisfied with this, he said it was like a revelation. Something seemed to twist his heart, and suddenly he felt an exultation, a sense of wonderful freedom. He felt himself at home, and he made up his mind there and then, in a minute, that he would live the rest of his life in Alexandria. He had no great difficulty in leaving the ship, and in twenty-four hours, with all his belongings, he was on shore. "'The captain must have thought you as mad as a hatter,' I smiled. "'I didn't care what anybody thought. It wasn't I that acted, but something stronger within me. I thought I would go to a little Greek hotel, while I looked about. Now I felt I knew where to find one, and do you know I walked straight there, and when I saw it I recognised it at once. Had you been to Alexandria before?' "'No, I had never been out of England in my life.' Presently he entered the government service, and there he had been ever since. "'Have you never regretted it?' "'Never. Not for a minute. I earn just enough to live on, and I am satisfied. I ask nothing more than to remain as I am till I die. I have had a wonderful life.' I left Alexandria the next day, and I forgot about Abraham till a little while ago, when I was dining with another old friend in the profession, Alec Carmichael, who was in England on short leave, I ran across him in the street, and congratulated him on the knighthood with which his eminent services during the war had been rewarded. We arranged to spend an evening together for old time's sake, and when I agreed to dine with him, he proposed that he should ask nobody else, so that we could chat without interruption. He had a beautiful old house in Queen Anne Street, and being a man of taste, he had furnished it admirably. On the walls of the dining-room I saw a charming bellotto, and there was a pair of zoffanies that I envied. When his wife, a tall, lovely creature in cloth of gold, had left us, I remarked laughingly on the change in his present circumstances, from those when we had both been medical students. We had looked upon it then as an extravagance to dine in the shabby Italian restaurant in the Westminster Bridge Road. Now Alec Carmichael was on the staff of half a dozen hospitals. I should think he earned ten thousand a year, and his knighthood was but the first of the honours which must inevitably fall to his lot. "'I've done pretty well,' he said, "'but the strange thing is that I owe it all to one piece of luck.' "'What do you mean by that?' "'Well, do you remember Abraham? He was the man who had the future. When we were students he beat me all along the line.' He got the prizes and the scholarships that I went in for. I always played second fiddle to him. If he'd kept on, he'd be in the position I'm in now. That man had a genius for surgery. No one had a look in with him. When he was appointed registrar at Thomas's, I hadn't a chance of getting on the staff. I should have had to become a GP. And you know what likelihood there is for a GP ever to get out of the common rut? But Abraham fell out, and I got the job. That gave me my opportunity. I dare say that's true. It was just luck. I suppose there was some kink in Abraham. Poor devil, he'd gone to the dogs altogether. He's got some tuppenny halfpenny job in the medical at Alexandria. Sanitary officer, or something like that. I'm told he lived with an ugly old Greek woman, and has half a dozen scrofulous kids— the fact is, I suppose, that it's not enough to have brains. The thing that counts is character. Abraham hadn't got character. Character. I should have thought it needed a good deal of character to throw up a career after half an hour's meditation, because you saw in another way of living a more intense significance. 
and it required still more character never to regret the sudden step. But I said nothing, and Alec Carmichael proceeded reflectively. Of course, it would be hypocritical for me to pretend that I regret what Abraham did. After all, I scored by it. He puffed luxuriously at the long corona he was smoking. But if I weren't personally concerned, I should be sorry at the waste. It seems a rotten thing that a man should make such a hash of life. I wondered if Abraham really had made a hash of life. Is to do what you want most, to live under the conditions that please you, in peace with yourself, to make a hash of life? And is it success to be an eminent surgeon with ten thousand a year and a beautiful wife? I suppose it depends on what meaning you attach to life, the claim which you acknowledge to society, and the claim of the individual. But again I held my tongue, for who am I to argue with a knight? End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Tiare, when I told her this story, praised my prudence, and for a few minutes we worked in silence, for we were shelling peas. Then her eyes, always alert for the affairs of her kitchen, fell on some action of the Chinese cook which aroused her violent disapproval. She turned on him with a torrent of abuse. The chink was not backward to defend himself, and a very lively quarrel ensued. They spoke in the native language, of which I had learnt but half a dozen words, and it sounded as though the world would shortly come to an end. But presently peace was restored, and Tiare gave the cook a cigarette. They both smoked comfortably. "'Do you know, it was I who found him his wife,' said Tiare suddenly, with a smile that spread all over her immense face. "'The cook?' "'No, Strickland.' "'But he had one already.' "'Yes, that's what he said, but I told him she was in England, and England is at the other end of the world.' "'True,' I replied. "'He would come to Papiti every two or three months, when he wanted paints or tobacco or money, and then he would wander about like a lost dog. I was sorry for him. I had a girl here then, called Atta, to do the rooms. She was some sort of relation of mine, and her father and mother were dead, so I had her to live with me.' Strickland used to come here now and then to have a square meal or to play chess with one of the boys. I noticed that she looked at him when he came, and I asked her if she liked him. She said she liked him well enough. You know what these girls are. They're always pleased to go with a white man. Was she a native? I asked. Yes, she hadn't a drop of white blood in her. Well, after I'd talked to her, I sent for Strickland, and I said to him, Strickland, it's time for you to settle down. A man of your age shouldn't go playing about with girls down at the front. They're bad lots, and you'll come to no good with them. You've got no money, and you can never keep a job for more than a month or two. No one will employ you now. You say you can always live in the bush with one or other of the natives, and they're glad to have you because you're a white man. But it's not decent for a white man. Now listen to me, Strickland. Tiare mingled French with English in her conversation, for she used both languages with equal facility. She spoke them with a singing accent which was not unpleasing. You felt that a bird would speak in these tones if it could speak English. Now, what do you say to marrying Atta? She's a good girl, and she's only seventeen. She's never been promiscuous like some of these girls. A captain or a first mate, yes, but she's never been touched by a native. Else respect, for you. The purser of the Oahu told me last journey that he hadn't met a nicer girl in the islands. It's time she settled down, too. And besides, the captains and the first mates like a change now and then. I don't keep my girls too long. She has a bit of property down by Taravao, just before you come to the peninsula. With copra, the price it is now, you could live quite comfortably. There's a house, and you'd have all the time you wanted for your painting. What do you say to it? Tiare paused to take breath. It was then that he told me of his wife in England. My poor Strickland, I said to him, they've all got a wife somewhere. That's generally why they come to the islands. Atta is a sensible girl, and she doesn't expect any ceremony before the mayor. She's a Protestant, and you know they don't look upon these things like the Catholics. Then he said, But what does Atta say to it? It appears that she has a begin for you. 
I said. "'She's willing if you are. Shall I call her?' He chuckled in a funny, dry way he had, and I called her. She knew what I was talking about, the hussy, and I saw her out of the corner of my eyes, listening with all her ears, while she pretended to iron a blouse that she'd been washing for me. She came, she was laughing, but I could see she was a little shy, and Strickland looked at her without speaking. "'Was she pretty?' I asked. "'Not bad, but you must have seen pictures of her. He painted her over and over again.' "'Sometimes with a pareo on, and sometimes with nothing at all. "'Yes, she was pretty enough. "'And she knew how to cook. I taught her myself. "'I saw Strickland was thinking of it, so I said to him, "'I've given her good wages, and she's saved them, "'and the captains and first mates she's known have given her a little something now and then. "'She's saved several hundred francs.' "'He pulled his great red beard and smiled. "'Well, latter, he said, "'do you fancy me for a husband?' She didn't say anything, but just giggled. "'But I tell you, my poor Strickland, the girl has a begin for you,' I said. "'I shall beat you,' he said, looking at her. "'How else should I know you loved me?' she answered. Tiare broke off her narrative, and addressed herself to me reflectively. "'My first husband, Captain Johnson, used to thrash me regularly. He was a man. He was handsome.' six foot three, and when he was drunk there was no holding him. I would be black and blue all over for days at a time. Oh, I cried when he died. I thought I should never get over it. But it wasn't till I married George Rainey that I knew what I'd lost. You can never tell what a man is like till you live with him. I've never been so deceived in a man as I was in George Rainey. He was a fine upstanding fellow, too. He was nearly as tall as Captain Johnson, and he looked strong enough. But it was all on the surface. He never drank. He never raised his hand to me. He might have been a missionary. I made love with the officers of every ship that touched the island, and George Rainey never saw anything. At last I was disgusted with him, and I got a divorce. What was the good of a husband like that? It's a terrible thing, the way some men treat women. I condoled with Tiare and remarked fleetingly that men were deceivers ever, and then asked her to go on with her story of Strickland. "'Well,' I said to him, "'there's no hurry about it. Take your time and think it over. Atta has a very nice room in the annex. Live with her for a month, and see how you like her. You can have your meals here. At the end of a month, if you decide you want to marry her, you can just go and settle down on her property.' "'Well, he agreed to that.' Arthur continued to do the housework, and I gave him his meals, as I said I would. I taught Arthur to make one or two dishes I knew he was fond of. He did not paint much. He wandered about the hills and bathed in the stream, and he sat about the front looking at the lagoon, and at sunset he would go down and look at Morea. He used to go fishing on the reef. He loved to moon about the harbour, talking to the natives. He was a nice, quiet fellow." and every evening after dinner he would go down to the annex with Atta. I saw he was longing to get away to the bush, and at the end of the month I asked him what he intended to do. He said if Atta was willing to go, he was willing to go with her. So I gave them a wedding dinner. I cooked it with my own hands. I gave them pea-soup and lobster a la portugaise, and a curry and a coconut salad. You never had one of my coconut salads, have you? I must make you one before you go. "'and then I made them an ice. "'We had all the champagne we could drink and liqueurs to follow. "'Oh, I'd made up my mind to do things well. "'And afterwards we danced in the drawing-room. "'I was not so fat then, and I always loved dancing.' "'The drawing-room at the Hotel de la Fleur was a small room, "'with a cottage piano and a suite of mahogany furniture "'covered in stamped velvet, neatly arranged round the walls.' On round tables were photograph albums, and on the walls enlarged photographs of Tiare and her first husband, Captain Johnson. Still, though Tiare was old and fat, on occasion we rolled back the Brussels carpet, brought in the maids and one or two friends of Tiare's, and danced, though now to the wheezy music of a gramophone. On the veranda the air was scented with the heavy perfume of the Tiare, and overhead the southern cross shone in a cloudless sky. Tiare smiled indulgently as she remembered the gaiety of a time long past. We kept it up till three, 
"'And when we went to bed I don't think any one was very sober. "'I'd told them they could have my trap to take them as far as the road went, "'because after that they had a long walk. "'Arta's property was right away in a fold of the mountain. "'They started at dawn, and the boy I sent with them didn't come back till next day. "'Yes, that's how Strickland was married.' End of chapter 51